Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Davis. I'm a professor here at NYU Law. And we're, it's our great pleasure to welcome you to the USLA Speaker Series. And our topic today is going to be exterritoriality in China's overseas uh, special economic zones. And our speaker is Adeli Karai, who is an assistant professor of global China studies uh, at NYU Shanghai, and is the author of several books, uh, including uh, a monograph, Sovereignty in China, Genealogy of the Concept since 1840. And so she's actually been thinking about these questions of exterritoriality uh, for quite some time, but from a somewhat different perspective. Um, and just before we get started, I guess I should mention our uh, next uh, session, which is about uh, going to be about the shifting uh, uh, party state boundary in China next week um, uh, on April 19th. Uh, so with that announcement, that public service announcement out of the way, uh, let's uh, turn things over to Delhi to hear about uh, China's special economic zones overseas. So, okay. so thank you so much for having me and for uh, chairing this uh, this session and uh, for Catherine for organizing this uh, this and of course uh, Jose as well for leading uh, USA Law Institute and today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, global China and the ex extraterritoriality in its overseas uh, economic uh, special zones. This is a new project, so it's a very preliminary work, and I'm planning to do more field work in the summer, uh, and so we can start with the PowerPoint. And so, yeah, you can. Okay, so this is just, uh, next one, why is not sure? Okay, here. Uh, so this back, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So this is just an image of uh, a map. I'm working on uh, global China and mapping uh, Chinese presence overseas. So I'm very interested in uh, global China, uh, China manifestations outside its borders. And uh, here we can see all the investments, or at least some of the investments, uh, a fraction probably of the investments that we were able to uh, uh, to monitor with this uh, project that I'm leading, mapglobalchannel.com. You see uh, cables, under, uh, underwater cables. Uh, and this partly shows uh, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, that I'm sure everybody has heard of. Um, and you know the kind of extent of uh, it gives an idea of the extent of a global reach, uh, and uh, Amy, sorry, and so um, China global reach manifested also from a normative point of view, and uh, it's very interesting because uh, the ambition of Xi Jinping also uh, can be seen in its uh, uh, idea of extending China rulings beyond uh, China's borders, and uh, we heard about Xi Jinping promotion of China rule of law overseas and foreign related rule of law. The way this is justified once we read the, the main uh, speeches of Xi Jinping or other uh, government documents or other officials uh, is justified to safeguard the development interest uh, of China and Chinese uh, nationals overseas, uh, preventing risks, uh, respond to challenge and protecting security and sovereignty, because as we saw in the image before, China is a bit everywhere uh, with investments and people, labor, investors, and so forth. And then another uh, justification of uh, um, this promotion for uh, China rule of law overseas is also uh, because of, as a counter, um, to counter US sanctions and its long arm jurisdiction. So it's a more defensive. Uh, I, even the other one is a bit more defensive, like is it the, the way it's justified at least. And then one of the <clears throat> key documents that was uh, issued uh, by the Legislative Affairs Commission, the National People's Congress Standing Committee last year, strengthening legislation in the field of foreign affairs and accelerating the establishment of a complete system of foreign related laws and regulations, it talks about a uh, battles over laws and regulation and further emphasize uh, the uh, two uh, justification points about uh, this uh, promotion of the rule of law overseas. And we can see already this uh, mixed or this kind of extraterritorial aspects of uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, kind of 
uh, the, the extension of, of, of uh, China jurisdiction overseas, partly here we see Italy that has this uh, joint uh, patro uh, with Chinese and Italian, and so here also quest, uh, raises question of extraterritoriality, uh, or uh, even Chinese police outposts uh, in New York. And there were two articles this year dedicated precisely to this, an investigation by the New York Times. Or also the aspect of uh, the extraterritoriality of uh, Chinese law is China anti-foreign sanction law, right? So that again, is it is justified in a defensive way, but it has an impact uh, on other countries' uh, jurisdictions. And then what I'm interested in that uh, would be the subject of my talk today is China uh, overseas special uh, economic and cooperation zones. Uh, and so here we see some dots. These are like the uh, 33 uh, that are, uh, but there are many more. So it depends really by the, uh, by the, um, uh, by the data sets that collects the information. And then we will see later how the Ministry of uh, Commerce uh, uh, recognizes so far 20 uh, official uh, overseas special economic and cooperation zones. And what is interesting, what led me to this, of course, is sovereignty, thinking China beyond its borders. But there were, I, I was interested because there were there was some literature that discussed uh, these zones uh, as enclaves of uh, extraterritoriality. And so in particular, we have uh, this French author Thierry Perrault and uh, Paul uh, Nieri that argue that uh, these Chinese finance special economic zones uh, already constitute a city-sized ecosystem abroad or Chinese enclaves that help boosting Chinese economy at home through the creation of quasi extraterritorialized extra industrial parks. And Niri, for instance, uh, he did uh, a lot of research on uh, uh, these parks in Laos and Cambodia and uh, argued that uh, in Cambodia and Laos, uh, this uh, special economic zone already um, are extraterritorialized foreign settlement on, and concession. That, resemble very much what happened in China at the end of the Qing dynasty in the 19th century, where foreigners leased territory and uh, uh, had uh, the, 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 they were regulated through extraterritorial extra -territorial jurisdiction. And so the question uh, that this uh, preliminary paper wants to address uh, is to what extent uh, is the case that uh, these special economic zones are extraterritorial anchors uh, or sinicized uh, um, economic uh, uh, ecosystems? And uh, what is so special about them? What is so Chinese? And the focus uh, of today will be on China Belarus Great Stone Park and Zambia China Cooperation Zone. Okay, so first I want to say a few words about extraterritoriality and the misalignment between territory and sovereignty. And so when we think about sovereign sovereignty, and then uh, as uh, Professor Kevin Days uh, mentioned before, I've done a lot of work on sovereignty, um, we have this idea that uh, sovereignty is uh, something fixed, right? We have a sovereign territory uh, and a very static conception of uh, borders that is ahistorical, uh, cannot really move, uh, uh, very static. Uh, however, globalization uh, challenges the effectiveness uh, of this uh, understanding of sovereignty because we move as people, uh, investment moves, money moves, trade moves goods all around the world. And so we've seen that like with the concept, with emergence of sovereignty, so sovereignty as a key framework for international uh, society, uh, it also merged the uh, uh, area of extraterritoriality because it couldn't function. So it has a lot of limitation. It's a normative system to which we aspire, but then as a matter of fact, it functions through uh, exceptions, right? So there are a lot of exceptions and these uh, special economic zones uh, are uh, represent a sort of exception uh, in this uh, um, world of uh, uh, sovereignty. And so to address the limitation of national border, nations have engaged in activity outside their sovereign borders through settlement, concessions, and leasing territory rather than conquering by force, right? So we just saw so now Ukraine, but that is, is an event that is quite rare in international affairs nowadays because there are much softer ways, informal ways to expand the 
your uh, a country domain uh, in outside of one sovereign uh, borders. And so this is a, can be ref uh, referred to as extraterritoriality that reflects a fundamental misalignment between territory and the legal construct of sovereign authority and uh, territory. And uh, uh, here I refer to Keller Esterly that called uh, this process extra, extra statecraft that describes the global system as a zone uh, and the political and economic processes that create and influence it as an extra statecraft, which is the statecraft applied to extraterritoriality. So basically, the world nowadays functions through these zones of extraterritoriality. They're part of our globalized uh, system. And so states offer multiple jurisdictions with often different allegiances and laws, and where states intentionally divide their sovereignty into heavily and lightly regulated area that are left uh, to uh, potentially extraterritoriality. And so extraterritoriality can also be understood in two ways. So one as a status of being exempt from the laws uh, of the territory, territory on which one is physically present. So one of the most common examples is a tax exemption in these uh, areas, uh, or also competence of state to make apply rules of conduct to physical and legal person property beyond uh, its uh, sovereign borders. And this, for instance, uh, um, it happens in cases of cyber crimes, uh, terrorism, antitrust, securities, where you have a legislation that, uh, in a way, uh, um, kind of deals with the people beyond the uh, one sovereign uh, border. And now let's move to um, the uh, special economic zones. So, special economic zones have been uh, key to the development of China uh, after Deng Xiaoping opening up of, of China and reforms. One of the most fa famous one is Shenzhen, and basically it was a sort of concession within China where um, there were preferential treatment uh, to attract foreigners and investors, and it was very successful. China was one of the leader in the special economic zone domestically. And um, this became part and it also a very important part of China going global and an even more important part of the Belt and Road Initiative, where China started to export its model abroad. Uh, also under the suggestions of the World Bank, where the World Bank actually admired special economic zones of China and started to promote them in Africa, uh, saying, oh, look how, how well China did. So maybe this could be a model to be exported, to be applied also in other uh, countries. And as I mentioned before, <coughs> China has uh, uh, the China Minister of uh, uh, Commerce has so far certified 20 overseas economic and trade cooperation zones since 2016, and they are defined as industrial park finance and constructed by Chinese funded holding companies registered in the territory of the PRC with independent legal personality. And uh, usually it starts with the uh, uh, government uh, agreements and then the formation of a, a Chinese uh, and host country joint venture that gradually attracts Chinese investment, Chinese companies, private and state owned, and then also bring very often Chinese labor. And so this is an image of uh, some of these uh, special zones. The red ones are the ones that are recognized uh, by the, um, by the uh, China Minister of, Foreign, uh, of, uh, of Commerce. And then there's like other, the green ones that are part of the uh, Belt and Road. I mean, I'm sorry that uh, it's not very clear, but uh, I mean, it is clear quite, but it's also not clear the Chinese characters, okay? And so how does China regulate uh, this, uh, um, these zones overseas? So there are ministerial regulations on overseas special economic zones. And it's interesting to see that rather than uh, uh, promoting the exemption from host country regulations, the, the, the key uh, um, uh, regulation that I found actually tried to push for, um, uh, to, to promote the respect of host country laws uh, and uh, uh, relevant regulations. Uh, so here we see abide by, the, by local laws and regulation, pay attention to environmental resource protection, respect lo local social custom, protect the legitimate rights and interests of local employees and fulfill necessary social responsibility. So, there is a push actually from uh, the Chinese government regulating these uh, uh, zones overseas to really respect 
that country law rather than imposing uh, a China uh, law. And so let's look quickly at the two cases. Uh, so the China Belarus Industrial Park Great Stone. And so the, the uh, intergovernmental agreement was signed in uh, 2011 to join uh, to, to establish a joint venture. And the park had three level of management an intergovernmental coordination council of the park and one park administration that are both made of Belarus and Chinese uh, councillors. Uh, and then it joined the established companies for the development of the park. Uh, and then in 2017, the president of Belarus signed a new decree on improvement of the special legal regime of the China Belarus Great Stone Industrial Park that further, further defines this uh, special, special uh, status for, uh, for the industrial park residents and investors. And so if you look <coughs> at this presidential decree, uh, there are a lot of um, exceptions uh, and uh, provisions that are, are, um, are, uh, are granted to uh, investors and foreign investors. And so, for instance, Article 2.2 says that activities of the joint company are performed based on principle of the inadmissibility of any intervention in these activities of state bodies and other organizations of the Republic of Belarus. So things happen, you know, we, we saw before the uh, administration structure, and so it's this uh, bodies that are managed by both Chinese uh, and Belarus. So the government doesn't have to interfere. Then residents of the industrial park subject of innovative, innovative activities of the industrial park, the joint company have the right to conduct procurement through its own means without application of the legislation, uh, then the lease of the land uh, over 99 years, and that there is all a question about leasing territory uh, with respect to sovereignty and what kind of rights are granted and how sovereignty of the host country is sacrificed. And then Article 26 states that the regulation established by the law of the Republic of Belarus uh, uh, on prices and tariff for goods related to the constructions are not applied. So here also we have a suspension of uh, uh, tax and also there is an exemption from labor regulations. Uh, then there was another uh, framework agreement signed in 2014 uh, that provides for the creation of a joint committee to oversee the implementation uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the special zone and address any dispute that may arise. And the joint committee is responsible for ensuring that the project is implemented in accordance with the laws and that uh, um, and for resolving disputes that might arise between uh, the parties. So in case uh, um, the disputes arise. And then we have last the Zambia China Cooperation Zone that was established uh, in 2016, also with another uh, intergovernment agreement that set up a joint venture. The zone was inaugurated in 2007. And there are two parts of this zone. Uh, so one is in uh, uh, Chambisi, uh, that uh, uh, and the land lease is for uh, 60, uh, 76 years, and the other one is in uh, Lusaka East. And there's been a lot of secrecy around the negotiation of the agreement, and uh, some have complained about the land, land expropriation. Some argue that uh, China didn't pay much, if not anything, for the uh, for the land. So this is still kind of covered in secrecy. And then also here we have preferential policies. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, for tax, uh, um, uh, tax treatment uh, in the areas preferential. Uh, however, there is also, if we read through this document, there is also a lot of uh, reference to Zambia local laws. And so uh, the investors in China must respect uh, certain requirements of Zambia laws and strictly abide by laws and policies of the Zambia Labor Department. So China here, it's very different from the Belarus situation, okay. And then if disputes arise, there was an agreement between uh, China and Zambia that uh, established uh, the zone um, dispute resolution mechanism. Um, and uh, so uh, if disputes arise, they should be resolved through consultation or negotiation. Otherwise, if uh, they are unable to resolve uh, through those means, they have to um, they can submit it to an arbitra arbitral tribu tribunal. However, this has not been smooth at all. And so there was a case in 2019 of uh, a Zambia workers, uh, Zambia workers that uh, uh, complained about uh, uh, the, the way he was, they were treated. Um, and uh, there were strong clashes between workers uh, 
and the Chinese employers. And this actually followed the 2005 uh, and 2006 uh, protest of workers in the Zambia mines so that killed, uh, there was a fire that killed uh, a few uh, Zambia workers. And then in response to the dispute, the Zambia government intervened and established a commission of inquiry to investigate uh, the matter, and then recommended that the zone management put in place measures to address the concern of Zambia workers. But then the issue is also of, uh, is, uh, of enforcement, right? Whether Zambia has, uh, government has the capacity to enforce uh, this, uh, uh, even these recommendations. So last slide preliminary conclusion based on the observations is that Chinese companies enjoy some degrees of extraterritoriality in these uh, two overseas uh, um, special zones. Chinese companies can lease territory up to 99 years in Belarus and up to 88 years in Zambia, suspending partly the host country uh, sovereignty. They also enjoy tax exemption or reduce tax. And in the case of Belarus, Chinese companies are even exempted from labor law and administrative jurisdiction because we saw that uh, the main administrative body is made by Belarus and Chinese. Uh, China, um, Chinese uh, overseas special economic is not directly the target, I think, of Xi Jinping's new push for extraterritoriality. Uh, rather, it is a, is a status that it is acquired through an agreement uh, between China, an intergovernment agreement between China and the host country. And then, of course, there is a question of uh, uh, power uh, imbalance uh, uh, and, uh, and, and difference in power. So you, you can question whether China is pushing really things through this agreement. And uh, unfortunately, very often we, we, we don't uh, fully know. And so what makes, uh, what makes it Chinese? For sure, state involvement. Um, and the presence of state-owned enterprises and also Chinese labor that has to be uh, regulated in some way, right? And, uh, but ultimately, I think that these special economic zones are more the effect uh, of uh, globalism that uh, generates this proliferation of these zones. And uh, the fundamental, again, misalignment between sovereignty as, and this uh, very fixed uh, notion of borders and what is the reality of uh, global uh, capitalism. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, to start, maybe I'll just follow up with a few questions that clarify a couple of points that you raised. Um, you said that you were going to address basically two questions uh, in, in examining these special economic zones. One is, are they truly examples of extraterritoriality or how do they compare to the other examples of extraterritoriality that we're familiar with, uh, whether in China or elsewhere? And then secondly, what's special about them, which is a broader question, which I'll leave for a second. Uh, but just on the first point, um, whether these actually represent examples of extraterritoriality, uh, you quite helpfully suggested that there are two distinct forms of extraterritoriality. Uh, one, both involve projection of legal power um, uh, beyond uh, territorial borders, but one simply involves the use of that power to limit the sovereignty of the host state, right? To carve out exceptions. Right? And so that's that's one. And the second was to extend power overseas to affirmatively regulate, to govern uh, behavior, to impose rules of conduct and so forth. And so I understood from the presentation that there are examples of the first form of extraterritoriality in these, uh, these, uh, these uh, special economic zones, and actually in Belarus, where there are quite an extensive set of exceptions um, from, the, from the whole state's law. But I wasn't so clear on whether these either uh, case involved exam examples of extraterritoriality in the second sense, the application of Chinese law overseas. So for instance, in Belarus, I was wondering, well, if Belarus's labor law didn't apply, what did? Did Chinese labor laws apply mm -hmm. there? Um, and even in the Zambian case, was it a case, was it the situation that uh, there was an overlay, right, where both Chinese labor standards and uh, Zambian labor standards would apply to say Chinese workers in, in Zambia. So, uh, or could be environmental standards or anti-bribery or whatever, but the, 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 the fundamental question is, 
to what extent does either of these cases involve extraterritoriality in that second sense, um, meaning application of Chinese regulation to conduct occurring in the in the in the zones? Yeah. Thank you. This is a great question. And uh, uh, for this, I probably will need to do field work because from online, I was actually trying to look for cases, uh, right? And so because from specific cases, you can understand better what is actually, to what extent the Chinese law can, uh, you know, can be applied or, or um, but I, and I think that uh, uh, in terms of, so Belarus, uh, it says, at least in the agreement, that Chinese law will apply. But then I, I, I need to see a case, and I haven't found a case yet to, to determine to what, to what extent. But according to the agreement, it could apply Chinese labor law. In the case of Zambia, uh, it cannot. As a matter of fact, it does, because we saw a lot of uh, protest uh, of uh, uh, of uh, Zambian worker that uh, that, were, that were, were treated were not treated right according to Zambian law, not Chinese law, and then the Zambia government stepped in and created a commission that gave suggestions to the um, to the to, to the uh, Chinese uh, manager of the of the of the special economic zone. But then again, there is the issue of enforcement and. To answer this question, I guess one really has to go and see, I mean, do, do a more, uh, more field work. But the Belarus case, yeah, in theory, Chinese law could partly apply. We don't know to what degree. And it's very confusing, a bit messy, right? Because even from, from the agreement point of view, it's very confusing. If I were an investor there, like if I were a worker, even more, what kind of law? What are my rights based on, uh, on, uh, on this agreement? Yeah. Okay. But there, there will be, uh, this uh, again, I think it's more a status that is carved out from the from the country rather than an actual push beside the the the, the Belarus case. Uh, many other cases also China tries to uh, as also it said I, I discussed when I when I mentioned the regulation of uh, uh, Chinese overseas economic zone. They try to really respect cross country laws and regulations. That's one of the priority. And then again, if it's done as a matter of fact is a different story. And it's interesting on another point is how Chinese sometimes are mistreated. And so for instance, in Belarus, there was a case in 2015 where there were protests of Chinese workers against uh, the Belarus police. Mm. And so mm. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, yeah, resistance uh, um, uh, and yeah. Interesting. Maybe let me move to the second question because uh, again, it's just a matter of asking you to elaborate a bit on the what is special about this, uh, and especially given your background studying um, historical dimensions of Chinese sovereignty, I'm actually curious about whether this is uh, these these uh, practices are distinctive in a historical sense, and are there historical precedents for China exercising sovereignty? Overseas, beyond its territorial borders, uh, in this legal sense, um, or is this uh, 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 sort of a more recent development, a sort of uh, manifestation of uh, late twentieth century global capitalism, as you suggested at the end of at the end of your remarks? Yeah. So I, that's what I'm studying right now from a historical perspective, China overseas and like how extraterritoriality worked, how it understood it from the end of the Qing dynasty. And uh, China was very weak in the Qing. So it had no really big interest uh, also in its uh, diaspora, where there was a big diaspora in America, in Peru, in, uh, in Cuba. And, uh, and they, they couldn't at the beginning, they kind of looked down part of these people overseas, and then they started caring because it was a big international scandal, especially how coolies were treated uh, in uh, uh, in uh, in America. And uh, and so they, they their primary goal back then was just to protect these people, but they didn't really have much interest, economic interest uh, in uh, uh, in this this diaspora community overseas. It's only at the end of the 19th century that they start to recognize that these diaspora people have uh, an economic value potentially, but they didn't have a <clears throat> special economic zone. Special economic zone is something related to China that starts in the 70s. And then this overseas special economic zone is something even more recent. Uh, so I, 
yeah, I didn't find the special economic zones back then. You can find maybe enclaves of labor, Chinese labor, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it was very uh, different from what is going on uh, today. And that also reflects the trajectory of China becoming a great power in the international system. So you have uh, a China that is stronger and stronger that wants to assert its power overseas and its economic interests. Yeah. But I guess you're connecting, you, you connected the emergence of these special, like overseas special economic zones to the development of the domestic ones, right? And sort of treated them, presented them as outgrowths of the, yeah. or uh, as being inspired by the, the domestic ones. But there are other jurisdictions, other countries that have, um, have firms uh, with these kinds of special economic zones of say the US, US firms on the Mexican border in, in Mexico, the Matilladoras. Uh, so that, that would be uh, one well-known category. And then there are also examples of say, other states like Gulf states purchasing mm -hmm. land or leasing mm -hmm. land for uh, on, on, under long-term leases, uh, say in the Horn of Africa, um, which are similar in sort of structure. So is there, um, I guess I have two questions about that. Was was there any, has there been any learning from uh, those examples by the Chinese? That's that's one question. And then also what's different? Uh, so maybe it's a single question. What's similar and what's different about uh, the Chinese overseas special economic zones in relation to these other countries' uh, yeah. special economic zones? So it's another thing that I forgot to mention, of course, the least territory, right? The, from foreigners in China. Uh, so I think China was sort of a victim of, uh, was the object of this uh, uh, extraterritoriality. Uh, but of similarity and differences, uh, I guess uh, China, we, we think of China as being very exceptional, but probably it, I, my guess is that it's more similar to what others have done. The unicity of China is the number of this special economic zone uh, that are um, state driven. So there is the role of the state, right? So it starts with the intergovernmental agreement, and then you establish the joint venture, state owned enterprises are very much involved, uh, uh, Chinese company, Chinese labor. So I guess that's, that's different. You know, even if America starts uh, a a uh, special economic zone, I don't see them bringing a lot of labor necessary, like, uh, you know, building infrastructures <clears throat> in Africa. That said, actually, America tried uh, to, to build special economic zones in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq, but it failed mm -hmm. uh, in the, um, you know, 10 years ago or something. Um, China has been successful, I mean, mix of results about this uh, special economic zone, but it generates our studies that look at uh, the overall impact of the special economic zones uh, on the local economy. And overall, I mean, if you have to draw the, you know, the, 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 if you have to make a conclusion, it's been quite positive overall, a lot of very good spin off. Yeah. So again, that's probably the, the difference from a legal point of view, also the fact that you have a state that leads this uh, endeavor. Just in terms of the, the impact, um... <clears throat> We, it would make sense to think about the impact in economic terms. I can see that. Um, there's also a question, though, of the political impact and whether there's any there's been any pushback uh, in either of these countries um, by, say, local actors. You, you mentioned uh, some of the incidents in Zambia, but is there any information? And I mean, Belarus might be a difficult place in which to yeah. gather this information. But is there <laughs> any information about the the how it, this has been received in Belarus, or is that just a pointless question to ask? No, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. And uh, I guess as for the Belt and Road Initiative, how the Belt and Road or how these initiatives are perceived, because these are great opportunities potentially for the countries, and sometimes are described as the, you know, the the opportunity of a lifetime to have China investing in the country, uh, but uh, you have a mix of opinion because then you're like state to state. We often like we also saw their studies that show how Chinese investment goes uh, um, uh, in the in the hometown of the leader of a country. So there's like a bit of maybe corruption potentially there, and so from a state level, probably there is a welcoming of China money, and you know I'm sure there are 
a lot of people that uh, benefit from that in the administration. But then, of course, you have concern like people, workers, they're opposite. There's there's been a lot of uh, protests, uh, not just in Zambia. And then there is also uh, this fear of debt trap. Uh, a lot of countries, especially in Africa, are indebted hugely to China. And so there's concern about profitability because some of these projects are have not been so great, especially Belt and Road. I mean, as, especially economic zones is, is mixed, but in particular, the Belt and Road Initiative infrastructure sometimes uh, didn't fulfill the um, the aspirations and the goals that they had originally. So <clears throat> it's mixed, I guess. But still, overall, like they, they welcome uh, the the investments very often, especially in, in the developing world. Yeah. Now, the the <clears throat> concerns about uh, Chinese debt traps uh, have been. Uh, articulated, I think, most loudly by American uh, diplomats. Uh, this is part of the, I think, the, um, uh, the United States' pushback and uh, attempt to compete internationally uh, with, with China for influence. Um, I guess I have a question about whether there have been other reactions on the part of the US to these kinds of initiatives. Um, so th that's the first question, and then I have a similar question about other geopolitical ramifications. But what has been the American uh, yeah. response to this, if any? Yeah, no, America has uh, uh, has responded. I mean, it's it's been becoming almost uh, paranoid about uh, China. I mean, some of it is justified, some of it it's uh, completely blown up of a threat. And I think, as I said already. Um, uh, in other occasions, uh, the debt trap is a meme that has been created by the U.S. in particular, has been led by, by, by the U.S., but there's no evidence so far that China has plotted to put this country into a debt or, you know, take away land from them. Like Ambantota port is one of the leading cases for the debt trap. Then there was Mombasa port that was a mistake of the, uh, of the person who wrote a report. So... It's not uh, substantiated by evidence. That said, America has taken a lot of, uh, um, it's kind of geared up and tried to uh, reconquer the global South uh, through infrastructures. And uh, in 2018 or 18, it started with the global, um, the, what's the name? The, I forgot the, the network, the global, uh, uh, that was a framework of norms so to help uh, the uh, the building of good infrastructures or affecting good blue dot network, like not blue. Okay, uh, blue dot network, and uh, and then uh, in last year, in the occasion of the G7, it rebranded the uh, Build Back Better World mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, Partnership for Global Infrastructure. So. They're trying, and also with Africa, it changed completely the narrative. It's more equal, more on equal terms, and they try to invest. But then the question doing research on this uh, partnership is how much substance there is. So it's a lot of words, a lot of branding. We give all this money, like $300 billion, like, and you know, in partnership with, with European countries. But we don't see that many projects. Uh, and I think it cannot really compete uh, with China in terms of uh, infrastructures. And for special economic zones, I haven't seen anything in terms of trying to copy besides this, uh, these instances in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. But it was disconnected, I think, from China. Yeah. What about Russia? Because Belarus is right in Russia's backyard, as we know. And I'm just wondering how what their view has been about uh, Chinese involvement in Belarus. Um, is this something they've welcomed? and? If not, uh, has there been anything that they've tried to do about it? Yeah. So there's been some scholars that argued that uh, uh, Russia was not very happy to have China investing uh, so much in Belarus. Uh, but what can you do? I mean, especially now with the war in Ukraine, where China is basically like the most strong uh, uh, in, in direct actually direct supporter of, of Russia, right? That didn't you know didn't take the side of Western countries. It's uh, uh, it's uh, what you know they cannot they don't really have much leverage. Even if they are not happy with it, uh, there isn't really much uh, that they can do currently. Um, 
And Belarus, on the side of Belarus, has said it sees it as a great opportunity to reduce a bit the leverage that they had uh, on on uh, the, the, the Russia that Russia has on on Belarus. Yeah. Now I forget the map that you put up. I was trying to. There were no uh, special economic zones in in Europe, were there? Yeah. So there, the, there are two in Hungary, and you know Hungary. We have uh, this leader that is a. Uh, very close to China, who wants to be a bit rebel uh, in European Union, but uh, there are still European Union rules that about that China has survived. And there is one uh, in uh, Belgium. There is uh, a tech uh, based at Leuven Lanov University, a tech center. So where Chinese uh, tech companies are investing and collaborating with uh, with Europe. Not very much advertised. So I just discovered uh, recently doing research on special economic zone, but Hungary, that there, there are two. That and those two are um, they're officially recognized by the Ministry of uh, Commerce. So they're quite important and successful. Yeah. So I'll open things up to questions in a moment, but I was I'm curious about where your research is going from here. Are you going to look at more cases? Uh, to con that you would contrast with the examples of Belarus and 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 Zambia is that the goal or is it to go deeper into these cases to do the kind of field work that you're you're speaking about? Um, uh, so what what is the the, yeah. the the plan here the agenda? Yeah. So the broader plan is a book project on global China that looks at it from historical perspective. But this specific project, I hope to to have an article and uh, go deeper in this case, so the field work, but broaden up also the selection of cases, uh, including also uh, Southeast Asia potentially and Central Asia, and then also compare it to what exists already, so what other countries have been doing, right? So what to also determine what is so special about China. So what is so special about this uh, special economic zone, but also what is special about China? And for that, you need to have a, uh, uh, terms of comparison, so uh, what other countries have done currently and historically. But how easy is it to get the data? I mean, are the documents uh, for that uh, govern these things always accessible? No, not at all. Uh, but for instance, Belarus has a great website, which is strange, right? Because I publicize those documents if I were <laughs> China, but those documents are all available on the... Uh, so each uh, special economic zone, I mean, all the 20 that have been, and also they have their own website with the, with lo in local language and Chinese. And so sometimes they're all different, but some of them have uh, documents. Mm -hmm. Not all of Belarus was a great case and there's all this uh, material, but I think it's very important to do field work and try to understand also disputes when they arise and what happens and what kind of law is, uh, is applied, yeah. But why do you think Belarus is so transparent? Is it because they have nothing to fear in terms of domestic politics or? That's probably a good, uh, you already gave the answer probably. <laughs> I think <laughs> that probably is one of the, one of the reasons. Uh, uh, and I mean, it's in Chinese and Russia. So you need to, some of it is in English, but most of the documents are either in Chinese or Russian. So you need to be the Chinese or Russian to understand. Uh, and they actually, they have a great website. I, you know, it almost uh, make me uh, an investor when you wish to invest uh, in Belarus. Uh, yeah, it's a very good, well done website. Yeah. I guess I'm just wondering what what's going on in the countries that are not so open. Whether they, whether it's uh, whether there are even more exceptions being granted and even more uh, yeah. uh, significant uh, incursions on local sovereignty. Um, yeah. It's possible, and I guess uh, what also the work of uh, the people that I mentioned, like in Cambodia or Laos uh, or like some poor country, probably is it's possible that uh, China interferes, so, like have carved out an even broader sets of rights of extraterritorial rights in these places. But I need to do a bit more research on that. Uh, I see. Uh, let me maybe I should shift to questions because uh, I see there's one question online that picks up directly uh, from this conversation about Belarus and then uh, there's uh, some another that goes back a bit from the in the presentation uh, but um, I have to read the questions out is that 
Right. So, um, so this is from Diane Wilson um, asking if we could return to the China-Russia issue for a second in the case of Belarus. How has the Ukraine situation changed things? Has it put some stress on the relationship with China trying to distance itself uh, from the conflict and the sanctions? Uh, I mean, China is in a very uh, difficult situation right now. Uh, and uh, it, it did put a little bit of pressure, but like, you know, it also committed to an uh, unlimited uh, uh, friendship uh, with, with Russia. So uh, now I think we're testing to what extent this uh, friendship is unlimited. Uh, and just now there were like the European leaders in uh, uh, Beijing, they, had, they met uh, Ursula von der Leyen and uh, Macron, they met with Xi Jinping. And actually one of the uh, top thing in the agenda was to try and push for like, you know, China being a better mediator with uh, with uh, between Russia and Ukraine and maybe have a meeting with Zelensky, but uh, China also, we don't know exactly how much China has real influence. It has uh, a lot of economic leverage, political leverage, but uh, I don't know how much it can really uh, persuade Putin to change the course of things. Uh, but China doesn't want to have a war. Uh, plus, there's all this tension also with Taiwan. I don't think China has any interest in uh, escalating the conflict. And it also stated that I think we should take uh, Xi Jinping words kind of, you know, relatively seriously, that they, they, they want to like be mediator like, and they just, uh, um, uh, they want to be a more responsible power, being able to mediate between uh, countries and uh, promote peace. So I think that, uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, a. Okay. I'll just say for the people in the room, if you have questions, put up your hands and I'll keep a cue. Uh, in while you do that, let me read the, there's another question online that's, uh, I think about the sort of the more basic, almost a legal nitty gritty yeah. of this. Um, uh, Sam Goffman is asking if you could speak more about the legal and corporate infrastructure of these uh, uh, of the special economic zones, and specifically what Chinese entities are involved in the management. Um, yeah, so it depends uh, by the joint venture that is established. Uh, and uh, I mean, there are all these different agreements and you can check. Uh, so for instance, in Belarus, they have much more uh, say and much more uh, uh, power than, uh, than in Zambia or in other instances. Uh, and it really depends uh, on uh, different countries and different agreements. There isn't really a formula for the kind of role that Chinese has. But from what I've seen, the host country can also push back. I mean, there's a pushback from, from the country to uh, preserve uh, uh, more the sovereignty of, of the host country. And so, you know, putting a limit to Chinese uh, uh, inter over control over this, uh, this, uh, these areas. Uh, Jose Alvarez. So I'm curious, you mentioned some of the benefits of the Belarus agreement, and I'm curious what that is, because I've studied FDI for a long time, and the benefits are usually things that are stated, but then the data doesn't show up, mm. uh, that those are the benefits. So I'll mention a few, uh, that it's training local uh, labor, tech technological spillovers, that it increases employment lowers the unemployment rate, that it builds infrastructure, ports, and roads that are useful beyond the enclave of the special economic zone, that it increases exports, uh, and that maybe it grows the GDP more generally, and perhaps other things. That's usually the, the kind of list that I see for foreign direct investment. And as I say, part of the problem is the claims versus the data. So if you get to that part in your article, what do you expect are going to be the actual benefits yeah. of something like Belarus? And I mentioned Belarus in particular because the combination of the lease, uh, taking out the labor employment, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sort of curious what exactly is the selling point other than politics and possibly corruption, which I don't think they want to sell either of those, what exactly is the selling point that Belarus says that it gets from this in terms of any of those or other things that I just don't know? Yeah. 
uh, I mean, those are the things, but then, as you said, you have to see, you have to check. And I checked the, the 20, like the, the most of these uh, special economic zones, and actually you see uh, the increased number of employed people in the area. And there are studies also about technological transfer, especially of uh, um, uh, special economic zones in Africa, and they're actually quite positive. And there's also been a transformation uh, in terms of labor, because in the past, uh, uh, Chinese companies used to bring a lot of labor, Chinese labor, that, as you said, you know, you are supposed to create laborers here, local laborers, but I see only Chinese. Uh, but this has changed in the years. There is much more awareness of criticisms. Uh, corporate social responsibility also has been very much promoted, at least from an uh, official point of view. Then there is always this gap between uh, rules and implementations, what happened on the ground. Uh, but there is a desire, at least officially, to, to create jobs uh, and to be also well perceived by the people, because this also creates a reputational risk to China, right? Because if countries and people start to uh, start to complain a lot about, uh, oh, look at what Chinese investment have done, right? They just uh, brought uh, their labor, debt trap. And then I think countries, even though there is corruption, right? And so you always get like, you know, there's the people that get the money, but then overall it will be, it will backfire uh, China, this expansion of global China. Uh, and so for, in the case of Belarus, I need to check, but for the other one, I've now an article that will come out uh, hopefully next month that tries to uh, check the impact, the economic impact uh, uh, in terms of investment, uh, labor creation, tax, that uh, revenues for the host countries. And overall it's, positive uh you know it's uh cautiously I, I i will say that it's more positive than negative but then again there is a lot of variation so it's not uh, one format fit all all these countries have a different different culture different legal systems different infrastructures present legal infrastructure and physical infrastructures so it varies a lot yeah auto let off yeah <clears throat> thanks so much it's a very fascinating uh, discussion uh, uh, let me sort of uh, pick up on something that, you know, I think Kevin very briefly mentioned and you also very briefly mentioned, which is the uh, points of comparison. So let, let me suggest two, um, two comparisons. Uh, so I think just following this uh, conversation now in, in the Western uh, sort of regarding the Western sphere of, of economic and legal influence, uh, um, for example, uh, Paul Romer here has, of course, done work on 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 free cities and and about setting up these kind of independent territorial um regimes which carve out space for privileges that are economic and legal now in that case it's not a case of necessarily exporting u.s legal structures by setting up certain standards that do not exist in that territory and setting them up uh, there uh, so that's kind of interpreting the case of like carving out territoriality that's strictly speaking extraterritorial in this sense of exporting uh, and, and the other thing is <clears throat> just um, I think this week a new book came out by Quinn Slobodian mm -hmm. called Crack Up Capitalism um, he's sort of part of this neoliberalism discourse that that is very controversial but I think he points out some really interesting things about how for example after Brexit in the UK what you know what the Tories really wanted to do um, was to set up like a Singapore on the Thames and that was kind of also interesting case of setting up sort of an example of a, of a sort of um, different type of regime and 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 so so it just so there's a lot a lot of like influence going back and forth and indeed um, I'll finish with this even the early economic special economic zones in China were of course partially inspired by the examples of Singapore and Hong Kong and so there's a lot of influence going back and forth so I don't know if you have any thoughts on how how you how you think about like this kind of like interest in these kind of special special types of privileges in uh, also in, in the Western world in, in this broader sense. Yeah, this is actually a, a very good point uh, for the expansion of the peace, uh, right? And also looking at the inf historical influence, what influenced what, how things are also connected, not just within China. So that's, that's an aspect, the comparative part that I want to do both chronologically and, you know, currently what's going on right what are all these uh, other extraterritorial legal cities or other spaces of exception 
uh, that's more for a, yeah another kind of book. But uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and after you, you have to tell me the name of the book is uh, Crack Up Capitalism. What's the name? Yeah, I believe that's okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Just on that point, there's a question online about the comparison between the contemporary overseas special economic zones and the colonial concessions. You already touched on this in your remarks, but uh, did you want to say a little bit more about um, the the um, the differences, if any? Uh, uh, there are many, many differences because these were really kind of piece of territory carved out from, I mean, in the case of China, these territories, and, and also one difference were that there were courts that were set up, like, so the consul, there were mixed courts that would judge uh, the uh, foreigners that uh, reside in this peace territory. For now, there isn't such thing. Uh, so you have law, labor law, maybe from China that can be used, but then you don't really have uh, a, yeah, a, a court system to uh, to to judge this. Uh, this and also, Chinese are still subject in theory to the local law. Although there is this again, Xi Jinping extraterritorial push, right? And some regulation like cybercrime or other, they might have, uh, uh, they they might have this over uh, extraterritorial reach. But uh, in that sense, is different from uh, um, the, and I guess also the uh, the power dynamic because there you have like all this gunboat diplomacy. It was much more violent, like the way this territory were carved out. And I think this time. We also see that uh, a lot of these uh, special economic zones or even the Belt and Road infrastructure project, they are um, solicited by the host country. So it's not necessarily China that imposes it through violence, through gunboat. Uh, but again, there is this uh, economic uh, and you know power imbalance between China and this, uh, these other countries. Uh, Catherine Wilhelm. Yeah, I wondered to what extent is it possible to tell so far how much the overseas special economic zones are actually replicating the features of China's original domestic zones that made the domestic zones successful. Mm. You know, because originally the domestic zones were places of legal and regulatory experimentation, right? And they brought the regulator to the investor, right? Mm. So this concept evolved of the one-stop shop, you know, whatever mm -hmm. licenses you needed, whatever regulatory procedures you needed to go through, there would be one office you could go there and you could get all of your chops done, mm -hmm. you know, in an afternoon. And you could, uh, you know, have tax breaks, as you've mentioned, and, you know, exemptions from certain rules and regulations that made it more expensive to invest in China outside the zone, but inside the zone, you got these breaks and you got this efficiency, as well as, of course, the logistical convenience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there were a lot of different features that made them successful. How much of this is being replicated in Belarus and in Zambia? Yeah, so in Belarus, I think they're trying to create this one shop uh, stop. Uh, so also from an administrative point of view, uh, but in Zambia, it's a bit more complicated. And actually, I was reading an article about uh, it was confusing. It was from a legal point of view, like Zambia keeps changing the law. It was very unstable also for China. They also actually was criticizing the decision of investing on special economic zone in Zambia. And the answer, I think, again, uh, refers to the diversity of uh, the countries involved. And probably yeah, the aspiration is to copy the system, right, China model, but it's very difficult once you encounter the reality, the different legal and institutional uh, reality, infrastructure realities of uh, these countries. So navigating all this uh, sometimes chaos, it's uh, it's tricky, but probably as an intent, original intent, yes, to create something very efficient. And they repeat over and over the, the idea of one uh, shop, one stop shop uh, in, in documents. So that's uh, definitely in the minds of uh, uh, Chinese uh, government and, uh, and uh, uh, companies, yeah. Building on that, though, one uh, one one idea that I associate with some of uh, what happened domestically in China uh, was experimentalism. So the idea of permitting different things to happen in some of these zones, um, and then learning from the experience. Uh, is there any sense that that's uh, a feature of the overseas uh, special economic zones and 
and actually if, if sort of maybe relatedly, I was wondering about this the process of certifying them. Is you know what is the role of the ministry there? Is it just certifying once at the front end and then stepping back or making sure that certain formal requirements are satisfied? Or is there some uh, 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 deliberate effort to learn from the experience in one zone and transfer those lessons to, to other zones? Yeah. So in terms of experimentalism, I think that these zones are experimental for the, the, the very nature, right? They're like, it, it, they're a part of territory where you're experimenting different regimes. Uh, uh, then the learning part, I think it depends on the, so they're true learning parts. Uh, one is the Chinese that uh, wants to reproduce these uh, special economic zones. And then the other learning part is from the host country, right? So how much I want to, uh, you know, if there's like successful aspect of the special economic zone, how much I want to reproduce this into my own country. And I don't know, again, here it depends on the host country, how well coordinated it is, uh, the, the capacity of the, of the country. And uh, there are, I think, this uh, um, um, a transversal, like, so I think there are attempts to try and to coordinate first. And as I, as I discussed before in the documents, right, they try to also offer um, uh, insurance and the, and the company that help understanding the health countries regulations. And so there is an attempt from the central government of China to create something that is more uh, uh, coherent and learning also from the past mistakes and see what works better. So I think China, that, and China, we see this learning curve uh, in the past year. I studied a lot the Belt and Road Initiative and we can see how much China have learned. It was so so uh, steep, the learning curve in a positive sense. So how much action has been taken to address uh, issues of environmental impact? Or again, corporate social responsibility. I've done some work on that. And like in the past year, there are regulation that tries to really control and make sure that this uh, economic actors overseas uh, follow the rules, good governance. So in that sense, China is quite uh, quite impressive overseas, uh, global China and domestic is. So the question at the back. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm thinking, I'm curious about the these 99 years. Is it purely proprietary or does it involve a need like um, administrative or political power that can be exercised by, by China? Because you do mention that um, that re reminds people of the Britain's lead of the new territory, which was part of Hong Kong. And, but that was colonial and there was quite different. Or maybe it's the same. So I'm curious how different or how similar would that be? And a related question is that then the size of such such areas and then um, are they just like an industrial park or is it like those special economic zones in China often can be a city and it's huge. What kind of size are we talking about? Yeah, so thank you. Uh, in terms of uh, the 99 year lease, uh, uh, there isn't uh, any administrative uh, or political, at least uh, to start with, like in, in terms of lease. Uh, uh, and again, it varies uh, depending on the special economic zones. Uh, but then, uh, uh, you know, once a joint uh, venture is established, and if this joint venture is mostly Chinese, then you do have some sort of like broader administrative control, right? So, but from the agreement of the lease, uh, it's it's like government to government. It's uh, it's not uh, uh, political control. So in the sense, it's different. And the area that it leads, it, it varies from five kilometer to twenty. Uh, mostly are industrial parks, especially the one that are defined by the uh, Ministry of Commerce. So these are industrial parks. Uh, but then there is also the model of the city uh, park, city uh, projects. So. Uh, I haven't those see uh, cities like in the 21 that I, I looked at, but there are cases where you have the city, the park, and the, you know, it's sort of expanded area controlled by China, uh, with our real estate as well, all sorts of industries connected with a railroad built by China. So uh, it's, it's an ecosystem. They try to create real ecosystems. Yeah. And again, it varies very much, very different situations, yeah, from very tiny to much bigger, different industry, different sectors. Yeah. Thanks. Question on the right. Yeah, I, I have a question. 
So uh, you talk, talking about this, this uh, extra 30, 30 liter. So my English is not good, okay. So uh, uh, 100 years ago in China, uh, you know, so many countries uh, have a lot of concessions. Uh, for example, in Shanghai, in Tianjin. So uh, they are different or similar to uh, before in China, uh, concessions, many countries, and today you talked about this. Yeah. So as I said, there are some similarities, uh, but this uh, before I think this uh, this territory was really almost a piece of sovereignty that was completely carved out uh, uh, for for you know from this uh, foreign powers. And one difference was that there were courts that would judge, and the foreigners were under jurisdiction of the of this uh, foreign uh, of the foreign country. Uh, so that's the main uh, difference, I guess. It was like a much broader. Uh, control, administrative, political, uh, yeah, control than than uh, than now. What's happening now? But on that front, we so recent commentary has focused on uh, a couple of extensions of Chinese legal power overseas. One is arbitration and it's sort of gener uh, setting up new forms of dispute resolution mechanisms throughout the Belt and Road uh, Initiative. Uh, territories. And then the other phenomenon has been the stories about the police outposts, which you mentioned. Um, I'm curious whether there uh, there has been any, whether you found any indications of either of those types of activities in these places. So sort of okay. moving towards establishing these sorts of dispute resolution mechanisms. So the updated version of the, the courts, uh, the, 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 the tribunals are the, are, would be arbitration perhaps. And then have there been stories about police outposts, Chinese police outposts in, let's say, Zambia? Uh, in Zambia, not, but in Cambodia and Laos, yes. And uh, and it, again, it's hard to find. Like doing a, a desk work is hard to find. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to be there and and figure it out. I don't think they 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 publicize it that much. But that's a very interesting point and something that I will look at. Uh, and then in terms of arbitration, I think. Uh, uh, companies signing like once you enter the uh, special economic zone and then you enter like in, you know you want to get in into agreement then usually this is added by Chinese company as a clause arbitration clause uh, that the dispute uh, should be uh, um, should be uh, uh, tried by Chinese uh, new arbitration courts uh, or mediated by Chinese new mediation courts. But that also depends. I mean, also whether Chinese law or other laws apply, it's really depends on the specific agreement between uh, yeah, investors and yeah. And unfortunately, those are almost impossible to access. Uh, exactly. If someone who tries to do research on contracts, uh, it's a real challenge. Yeah. I realize there's a question I have that I should I feel like I should know the answer to, but I, 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 it occurred to me just as you were speaking a, a few minutes ago. Are there non-Chinese entities in any of these uh, zones operating in these zones? Yeah, yeah, there are. So, there are. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's mostly Chinese, uh, but there are also it's open to to foreigners. It tries to attract uh, all sorts of uh, foreigners, and I, I guess if you look at the Belarus website, you will, you might be willing to invest uh, yeah. the way it's uh, it's so well well presented. So yeah, okay. yeah, it's open. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Uh, sure, and then we've got one behind you as well. Okay. Yeah. Kevin, actually, that was my question: whether yeah. whether other foreign investors had uh, been attracted to the zones, and so yeah, um, yeah, and it's actually interesting because uh, one zone in uh, um, Cambodia uh, was created by Japan, and then like China expanded it. So it's interesting to see how there are different uh, countries involved, companies involved, and yeah, it's not. Uh, So, uh, how how do you think about uh, the recent uh, transnational uh, repression uh, government here in, in America? Uh, transnational repression. The <laughs> Quack or Zinga, you can Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
in America? In China? Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Ch Chinese government, uh, transnational repression. Uh, yeah, you know. Sort of censorship uh, of nationals. Are you thinking uh, of a specific example or case? Uh, I'm sorry, this? Who's that? Yeah. This one? Transnational repression, yeah. the relationship between extraterritoriality and transnational repression. I'm not sure mm -hmm. what but, that means. But is there is there a specific case that you're thinking of? Oh, so so for example, uh Chinese government uh, uh, police station in New York. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, Nicola, did you? Yes. yes. Um, I'm not a legal historian, but I, I, I have a very, very basic question here because you spoke about the misalignment of between sovereignty and territoriality. Uh, but it seems to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that if the, um, the government of Belarus or the government of Zambia at some point changed and under domestic or foreign pressures decided to pull mm -hmm. out of these agreements, not nothing would stop them from doing that other than some potential economic penalties and so on that they have to pay. And since the Chinese investment is relatively limited, I mean, one industrial park does not make Belarus a client state of China, right? Yeah. So um, these state host states can still exercise the sovereignty by simply you know, uh, uh, pulling out of, the, of, of their agreement with China. Um, is there any way that Chinese, the Chinese government can, you know, reduce risk, that kind of political risk, or uh, affect their investments in some other way, yeah. or guaranteeing this private company's investment? Because it seems to me that the risk is fairly high, yeah. especially, you know, considering the, the political instability of some of these countries. It is very high. It is very high. Uh, yeah, it's a great question, and that's uh, that sort of about extraterritoriality. It is a temporary suspension uh, of uh, the host country sovereignty as long as the agreement is for, or if uh, because even even if it's a lease, it's ninety nine years, and then what, right? Or it can also end before if the government change, right, and decides to kick out uh, China, and that's a risk. Uh, and we saw also in Libya that China has to move out a lot of its uh, nationals and lost a lot of money. Uh, and this is in the mind. That's why also they try to promote part of their own law, like this push for China law overseas uh, motiva is motivated really to protect uh, and to uh, decrease the risk. But is there political risk? The only way to do it is to maybe position more military, to, to have a stronger military presence. But ultimately, uh, it's, uh, yeah. You did mention, though, in the Zambia case, that it was backed by an investment treaty. Yeah. And those treaties, and you'd have to check, are subject to 20 years of the current investment being protected plus another 10, depending on the tax, and then backed by investment arbitration. Depending on the arbitration, if it's backed by the New York Convention and everything else, that adds to any political risk insurance that's usually there. So that in many cases, Yes, the government may try to pull out, but the investors, at least under that arrangement, remain protected for a good long time. And this is an aspect of international law. Yeah. Yes. And if, also, if they have that. Yeah. Now, Belarus, you yeah. didn't mention that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Belarus also has uh, uh, a bilateral investment treaty with, uh, with China. But then, yeah, I guess uh, they are partly protected, but, you know, nothing fully protect them from you know change of government a change in law as well host country laws and regulations that might transform substantially the the rights that the Chinese enterprises or the 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 privileges that they can have in in the in the area yeah. but the debtor creditor relationship is also relevant so to the extent that they uh might owe China uh money and want to uh have access to additional uh, credit from China, that would be another source of leverage. So it's, it may be more than just an industrial park um, uh, in any given case. Um, but Britta. Yeah, um, 
just a question. I, I don't know whether you looked at um, any special economic zones that are that involve an extractive industry, like a mine or something like that. Um, I'm curious if you have had the chance to look into those. How whether the uh, whether the, uh, the the payments to the government are different in a special economic zone that includes an extractive industry like mining than they might be if they occur outside of that zone. So if the if the payment like the, the payment is different, right to, to the government, yeah, probably I don't know. I mean, Zambia actually is an extractive; it's a uh, copper mines, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but I, I yeah I don't know about this specifically. This is a good question also to compare. And I cannot remember if Zambia is a member of the extractive industries transparency initi initiative, which. Uh, if they are, maybe there there would be more transparency. Yeah. There ought to be transparency <laughs> around uh, the the revenue flows, but uh, I doubt. You, <laughs> sorry, that that sounds fair. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. So, have you had a chance to look at how disputes that emerge are actually being dealt with? Like, what is the choice of tribunal? As you know, China set up the um, China International Commercial Court. Yeah. with the idea of providing a venue for these kinds of mm -hmm. um, commercial relationships to settle disputes. And the court also has a mediation service affiliated mm -hmm. with it. It, well, it's, it claims it can do mediation, arbitration, and adjudication all in one. Um, the last time I looked, which was at least a year ago, they had had hardly any cases mm -hmm. at all coming. But are you seeing what's happening with these disputes? No, mm -hmm. no. So I, I should look at that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a question online, which is about a completely different topic. Uh, so but before we get to that, I, I should I feel like I should canvas the room uh, to see if there are any other questions about uh, because right, the question is actually, I, I think stems right from your introduction or my introduction of you. Um, as about teaching in Shanghai and how that's going, yeah. basically, um, and whether the downturn in U.S.-China relations has uh, has affected um, uh, programs like uh, NYU's in um, uh, in in China. Uh, and then there are more specific questions about uh, what do you really choose to teach your course materials, uh, what trends in enrollment, and so forth. Uh, but maybe let's start with the general yeah. question. And, uh, yeah. So it has been actually great being back uh, in China and I went uh, at the right time February so I moved back in February and uh, it was pretty much normal I haven't to do I didn't have to do any test test uh, COVID test uh, no QR code or anything mm -hmm. and um, NYU Shanghai just opened a new campus a uh, very beautiful uh, huge campus and uh, uh, we're pretty free to discuss things within campus. There is a VPN service. Uh, so within the campus, there is free speech. Of course, you have to be a bit more sensitive about what you, the way you teach certain subjects because there is like some students that might be sensitive. And so, I mean, also here, it's the same in America. So it's the language and how you address certain issues is, uh, is important. You have to be a bit more diplomatic. Um, and. Uh, NYU Shanghai and the foreign universities are actually, I mean, a huge asset and China sees them, at least the Shanghai government, very positively. So from the Chinese government, there's not been, there's been a lot of support uh, for uh, NYU Shanghai. I don't know in the long run whether the U.S. government might do something. I hope not, because I think it's so important to have this people-to-people uh, exchanges through education so you have americans are able to go to china to the campus in shanghai and learn about china it's such a different world from what we hear uh, here in the news so i think these exchanges are very important to uh, give the possibility to students to really see with their own eyes and experience firsthand uh, china uh, in a, a privileged way because you can always go back to this uh, VPN zone, right? And we connect to Google, Gmail. Uh, but uh, I I think it's it's good. It's uh, it's welcome. And uh, at, at least my experience with NYU Shanghai. And it's very, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's important, again, that these exchanges uh, are uh, maintained and fostered. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I think that will conclude the session, but again, please join me in thanking Professor Karai. Thank you.